So here I am. I am indeed a futurist, uh, which I know sometimes is greeted with a little bit of cynicism as to what exactly does that mean? Do I have a crystal ball? Uh, no, I don't. Um, I've been working at Bursa Marstella, which is a global communications agency for the last 17 years. And in the last five years, I have been really studying the future because it's become very clear to me that it is pretty pointless to talk about individual trends, whether it's industry trends or consumer trends or digital trends, without having that bigger picture and the wider landscape. And that is why I think it's really important to look at megatrends. And megatrends are all about the big drivers of the future, and that is looking at the economy, looking at politics, looking at the social changes, looking at the way the environment is changing, and technology, of course, which is a massive driver of the future. And so I have selected for you today five megatrends. You're lucky, it could have been ten. Um, so we're going to whiz through these, and what we're going to look at is urbanisation, mobility solutions, new business model, social and demographic changes, and connectivity and convergence. So to start us off on urbanisation, this uh, looks a little bit like something out of uh, science fiction, but it's actually fact. This building was designed by Spanish architects, and it's called the Bionic Tower, and it's actually a city in a tower. It is 300 storeys tall. It's able to house 100,000 people. And as we speak, it's being built in Shanghai, a city which is massively expanding, as many are around the world. Because a city the size of Barcelona is being built every month in the world at the moment. And that's creating six million new urban dwellers. And that is where we're going. In 2050, there'll be 10 billion people in the world, 70% of whom will be living in cities. And what does that mean? That means that cities are becoming consumers in their own right, that they have massive needs for energy, for resources, for waste disposal, for communications, and they need smart solutions. And nowhere do we need smart solutions more critically than in the area of mobility. Mobility solutions. Um, we already have a lot of innovations going on in this space. I'm sure you're all aware of Google's driverless cars, and we will have driverless cars in the UK in the next five years. And when you think about the implications of driverless cars, hopefully it will bring about zero traffic accidents, which would be marvellous because the sensors work and nobody crashes into each other. But it also opens up immense leisure time for people who before were, of course, concentrating on the road. And what does that leisure time open up? It opens up opportunities for companies to communicate and entertain consumers like never before. And also in this space, you have disruptors like Uber. I hope you've all heard of Uber by now. Anybody taken an Uber ride? Yes, yes. So you might say Uber is a taxi company, um, which is indeed the space they're in, but in fact they are, of course, a technology company. They have devised a software and an app to match up drivers and passengers, but their ambitions don't stop there. They believe that ultimately they will make it completely unnecessary for you to own a car. Um, they think that they will have a solution in place that will take you door to door without the need to own a car. It will be seamless, it will be easily paid, it will be less expensive than the current situation. So that's Uber, and we also have an amazing entrepreneur in this space whose name is Elon Musk. He's a South African. He's based in California at the moment. He is the inventor of the Tesla electric cars, and not only that, he's building a rocket to Mars at the moment. Um, but also he's invented this thing at the bottom here. I don't know. Does anybody know what that is? It's the Hyperloop. It's described as a combination of the Concorde and an air gun. It's a ground transportation solution, and it's going to cut transport times, for example, from San Francisco to L.A. Instead of, at the moment, being three-something hours, it will be half an hour. And what is fascinating about Elon Musk is that he believes in open development and open collaboration. 
And what he's done here is he has brought this Hyperloop to a certain stage of development, and then he has freely revealed the patents to the world. And what his thinking is here is that this will allow many people to benefit from this development. Other designers can come in now, other funders, and bring this to fruition. And that is a key part of the new business models, which is this idea of collaboration and sharing. So one of the great examples of this is a company in America called Patagonia. They're a clothing company, and they famously took out an advert with a picture of one of their jackets saying, don't buy this jacket. That was an incredibly daring thing to do for a consumer goods company to say, don't buy our consumer goods. And you might think it was business suicide, but in actual fact, what they did by doing that was actually increase sales and increase loyalty. Because what they were saying to their consumers was, don't buy this jacket, either repair the one you already have or allow us to help you recycle it and be part of something that they call the responsible economy. The responsible economy is about not harming the planet. And what they understood was that we as consumers today are very conscious of the impact of our purchasing decisions. We've seen pictures of factories collapsed in India and the ramifications for the planet of our purchasing decisions. And what they've done is alleviate our guilt by showing us transparently where their goods come from. If you look on their website, you have a completely transparent a supply chain shown to you where the cotton comes from and the things that they're trying to improve that they haven't yet improved. So they're completely open and transparent about how they go about manufacturing. And I think for all of us in business, it's becoming more and more important for us to look at ways in which we can also share our knowledge and our experience, look at ways to lend, to gift, to share, to set up marketplaces and ways in which we can share our experience and our know-how. Social and demographic changes. I think we're all aware that the population of the world is aging rapidly. I know I am. Um, but what that is doing, it's got massive implications. For example, in the workplace, you have people like me who are going to be retiring much older than I thought I would. And um, that means that it's creating kind of bottleneck of uh, job supply, millennials not being able to get into the workplace. And indeed, what does the workplace of the future look like? In around 20 years' time, 40% of the jobs we know today will no longer exist because of automation, because of robots. Yes, robots are coming. And indeed, if 40% of jobs are going, 60% of jobs are going to be created that we don't even know what they are at the moment. We don't know what these roles are because those jobs don't yet exist, but they will. The other one I want to talk about is the rise of the economically empowered female consumer and businesswoman. Women today control $20 trillion worth of purchasing power. I don't know about you, but trillions start to make my head spin a bit. But $20 trillion represents one and a half times the purchasing power of the United States of America. So it's huge. And if you're not thinking about that consumer base, you're really missing out. And indeed, in terms of business, it has been proven, there are many studies that show that if you have a larger proportion of women in leadership, then you will have higher profitability, something like 47% more profitability the more women you have in leadership positions. So again, that is a huge demographic to be paying attention to. Lastly, and not least, um, connectivity and convergence. Of course, this is all about the 80 billion devices that we will have by 2050. Um, how we're all going to be connected, the Internet of Things, which is actually more radically life-changing than the invention of the Internet itself. I was speaking to someone before I started about wearable technology and just how connected we're going to be, how informed we're going to be, the quantified self-movement for people connecting their devices to find out about their fitness, their health, and so forth. Anyone here doing any kind of fitness tracking with wearable technology? Yes? 
well done. <laughs> so that's, that's the way of the future. Um, and, the, and the thing that I find fascinating about health and the health sector is that you have massive technology companies getting into that space. Apple, of course, recently announced their smartwatch that will come out next year. But Google, Google, I think, are the most fascinating of all in this space because, of course, they've got Google Glass, which is already being used in um, operating rooms in America. So surgeons in operations are actually able to call up patients' notes, look at videos of operations if they encounter something they haven't come across before, all on the fly, in situ, in the operating theatre. And that's quite extraordinary. But the other even more extraordinary thing about Google is that they have recently hired a futurist whose name is Raymond Kurzweil. And he, several decades ago, is the man who said that we would have immortality by 2025. And at that time, he was seen um, at worst as a nutcase and as, at best as a maverick. But time has shown that he is right, in fact. And what he means by that is not that we will necessarily be able to prolong human life as we know it, but that we will be able to download into software all of our thoughts and feelings and emotions and keep that long after we're gone. And so Google have just hired Raymond Kurzweil as their chief engineer to build a human mind. And this is quite extraordinary. And of course what it means is in building that human brain, we can examine how it functions and how it deteriorates over time and hopefully be able to alter the diseases of aging. So science fiction is becoming science fact. And for me, I think it's just so important to look at that bigger picture. And also, I have a few tips for you in terms of future-proofing your lives, future-proofing your businesses. As I mentioned, um, it's, it's a sense of urgency that you need to have in terms of thinking about the future. The future is upon us. The future is exponentially changing the world that we live in. So have a sense of urgency about examining the future. And for future-proofing, you need great leadership. You need leadership with purpose, leadership that is not based solely on profit motives because the consumers of today are very conscious consumers and they want companies to give back to communities and to society and you need to have that leadership with purpose. Why do you exist beyond the profit motive? And also you need leadership that is incredibly comfortable with the completely uncertain future that we face. They need to be comfortable with that degree of ambiguity. And as I mentioned about the workplace, we have people being educated in universities at the moment and coming out and thinking that's it as far as um, their learning is concerned. But no, for the future we need lifelong learning because everything we learn at university will be defunct after five or six years. So we have to keep going with learning. When I was at university, there were no computers. It's just as well I've kept on learning. <laughs> and finally, collaboration. I mentioned the whole open world of collaboration today, and that is absolutely essential for the world to progress, sharing and open collaboration. And if you want to see more about that, Don Tapscott is an amazing uh, guru on this subject, and he has a TED Talk which lasts 20 minutes and it's well worth watching on the benefits of open collaboration. So there we are. That's what I have for you today. Thank you.